Welcome. Uh, my name is Alan Benstock, and I am normally the person behind the scenes, uh, but I'm acting as host this evening for tonight's Million Talk. Um, Jonathan Strait is currently on holiday, taking much earned rest. So, as I said, I'm hosting, and I will now apologise uh, for any technical hitches, because as those who have joined us regularly know, that if I have to run it the cells we do, there's a lot of buttons to press and keep everything going. So I apologise now if anything seems slightly right. I hope that won't be the case. Anyway, welcome to the, tonight's uh, uh, Minim Talk. And before I introduce our guest speaker, just the usual house coping points, um, we will, uh, I'll speak, uh, just please feel free to ask any questions. Please put them in the chat and the Q&A. And this evening, this is particularly important, as our guest speaker, Professor, uh, Professor Rosa Friedman, has said that she will be talking, but if people put questions in, she will either eat, interrupt and uh, deal with them or uh, shorten the talk so all the questions can be answered. This talk is being recorded and will be available, as usual, on the Million website in the next couple of days, uh, subject to processing. And uh, as I say, I think we can. I can now press the right button. Hopefully, welcome our guest speaker. Yes, this is as I say. It's just a um, a moment of just getting things right. I need to just do something. That's right. So we should now. Oh, something's not quite right here. Anyway, there we go. Right. Welcome to our guest speaker. Um, Professor Rosa Friedman. And for some reason, I already have got a technical hitch. And I don't know. It's not a good start, this, is it? That's why they move the button. There we go. Sorry, one second. Oh, I must, I must, oh. Anyway, Rosa, welcome. You'll have to have an overview. For some reason, I can't put myself on the screen. And this is not making sense. You're also muted, I can see. There we I go. Thank you. Anything. Yes. So tonight's speaker, as I say, um, I'm delighted to welcome Rosa Friedman. And before we go the formal introduction, I think I might explain for our regular viewers that uh, this is not the first Friedman we have had to speak this year because uh, Rosa is the daughter of Jill Friedman, who spoke in February on that. If there could not be two more diametrically opposed topics, <laughs> we are the subject of Jews Jews feed goats. So if anybody remembers that wonderful talk, this is something completely different. <laughs> so, as I say, I welcome Rosa Freeman, who is the inaugural Professor of Law, Conflict and Global Development at the University of Reading. She is a non-practicing barrister and an academic panel of four to five greys in square. And she has, pu she has published extensively on the United Nations and human rights. Uh, published work includes three monogra monographs, five co-edited co collections, and articles in the lead in the leading international law journals, as well as policy reports commissioned by national and regional bodies and parliament. She regularly appears in the international media, uh, discussing human rights, international and humanitarian law, and the U United Nations. For our purposes today, she is um, seeing most significantly, she is a founding member of the intra-communal professorial group focusing on anti-Semitism in academia. And she is a visiting fellow at the London Centre for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism, with whom this we are, of course, uh, having this, uh, who have helpfully put together this series of talks, because this is the second of a series of talks, arising from the book that Rosa co-edited, uh, which is the R Routledge book series on contemporary anti-Semitism. She has served as a member of the, on the UN Secretary General's Civil Society Advisory Board on the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse. And she's a special advisor on safeguarding to the UK Government International Development Committee, uh, and uh, in addition to many other roles that she has in fact the papers run out at this point i haven't got everything here <laughs> so i think that's enough so um, i'm going to hand over to um rosa as i said please put your questions both in the q a and um i've just been told everyone can see me so that i don't know what happened there so that's good uh thank you jay uh please put questions in the chat and q a and we'll be able to run from there so i'll hand over to rosa thank you Thank you so much, Alan, um, and thank you to Milim for inviting me to speak tonight and to all of you for coming out. I apologise now, there is a 
huge thunderstorm going on outside. So I hope that the rain does not stop you from being able to hear me clearly. So following on from Alan's introduction, the reason that I'm talking tonight is about responses to the 7th of October, anti-Semitism, and with a focus specifically on universities and academia. Now, we put together an anthology of responses to 7th of October. Um, it's a three volume anthology because we had so many submissions from people that um, one volume was not going to be enough. We put out this call for people to provide three or 4,000 words, uh, particularly academics, but some practitioners. Um, and we had more than 70 submissions. We, we could just could not publish them all, um, but we they are raw and they are urgent, and they are sort of, they record a moment in time in those couple of months after 7th of October, when our whole, all of our worlds turned upside down, and where many of us felt incredibly impotent about being able to do anything for Israel, or about Israel, or about the global surge of anti-Semitism that was the direct response to the worst atrocities committed on a single day against Jews since the Holocaust. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about this volume, um, just a quick plug for it. Um, it's co-edited by me and by David Hirsch, who is the director of the London Centre for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism, along with Odelia Lanier Zafir, who is the director of the Intracommunal Professorial Group, which I will talk about uh, a little bit later on. It, uh, it's a struggle with words, but it's the ICPG, the acronym's easier. When we put together these three volumes, we looked at the the themes that were coming out, and it was clear that there was a theme about the responses were within law and society, and particularly anti-Semitism within law and society, and the rise of it after 7th of October. Another was in the discourse, polit political discourse, but also discourse on the streets, discourse in the media. And then the third theme that arose, probably cross-cutting across all three volumes, is universities. And it's a particular interest to me because I work in universities and I believe in universities as a place of knowledge production, a place of teaching, a place of shaping the future of our society, uh, whether they are scientists and doctors and engineers, or whether they are politicians and policymakers, artists. Our society re requires these young people to come in to learn from academics who themselves are doing research and are teaching them based on their research um, in order to tackle the problems that we're facing from climate change to wars and many, many more. And it's particularly concerning to me that universities, which are a place protected by academic freedom and free speech, have become a place, a site, for anti-Semitic discourse and practice. And I really wondered why. I looked at some of the responses that we received and in particular, the response from Eric Heinzer, who disclosure was my PhD supervisor and remains one of my mentors and a brilliant thinker, um, who looked at the history of the far left anti-Semitism and how academia has been co-opted, particularly in the social sciences and the arts and humanities, in such a way that anti-Semitic discourse has become normalized and part of the course. I'm not gonna to talk to you about his response, but it made me go away and do a bit of my own research. And it became clear that during the, and particularly after the Cold War, the far left were looking for partners with anyone who would, take on what they consider the great beasts and the great terrors of capitalism, and in particular, the United States of America and her allies. And they were willing to partner up with any of those groups in order to challenge um, to challenge capitalism. You know, the old adage, my enemy's enemy is my friend. And this led to some very surprising results. So the far left or the communists, um, teamed up in Iran, radical Islamists, to overthrow the Shah, which they saw as, you know, a puppet of the of the United States of America. And they they felt that, you know, if they overthrew the Shah and they put into place an Ayatollah, that then they could eventually convince the radical Islamists to do things that the communists believe in, like 
non-discrimination against women or freedom of religion or belief or removing religion or belief. What they really found out quite quickly was that after the Shah was overthrown, the universities were, all the far left were removed. They were crushed. They were taken out of the universities and out of academic spaces. And instead the Ayatollah and his regime put into place puppet academics to replace them. Um, Iran is the, is a sort of really grave and obvious um, example of this, but it's by far um, from the only example of the radical left teaming up with anyone that's against capitalism. And as the 1980s progressed and with the 1990s and the sort of world reconfigured, the geopolitical landscape changed um, and the Cold War, it was clear, really had ended other than in pockets of spaces. Um, the radical left, particularly in America, took root in academia. They saw that as a space where they could continue to propagate their theories and ideologies and their discourse. Now, what we've seen, we can also see this at the United Nations and international bodies and, and, and further back than this, but I particularly want to focus on universities because what they saw is something that the rest of us, well, I was still young then and in primary school, but the rest of us didn't anticipate, which is in order to change the discourse, you need to play a long game. You need to change the discourse for young people who are then going to go out and become policy makers, uh, members of the media, the liberal arts. Um, you want to shift their, their understanding and how they argue about things so that in the next generation and the generation after, this becomes normalised. And that's really what we're seeing today. I was particularly taken aback. I'm, I work in law and law is political, but it's a fairly objective discipline. Um, particularly where it comes to language. I was particularly taken aback as an understatement about the response of some people within law schools to 7th of October. Before Israel had finished counting her dead, before Israel had contemplated mobilizing hundreds of thousands of soldiers to try to secure the release of civilian hostages, older people, Holocaust survivors, babies, people with disabilities, the international lawyers, not all of them, is a small but vocal minority, and this is a theme that comes out constantly, it's always a small but very vocal minority rather than the majority within academia. We're talking about legitimate acts of resistance, as though rape or sexual violence is ever legitimate, let alone as an act of resistance. They were talking about um, how Israel should not have the right to defend herself. You know, Israel should exercise restraint while Israel was still discovering the bodies and the gruesome atrocities that I don't need to tell anyone on this call about. Um, and law was relatively tame in this compared with sociology, compared with history and classics in English and media studies and other parts of the non-hard science. I'm not talking about the engineers, the computer science, the medical schools, but the social sciences and the arts and humanities. And um, what occurred to me was it wasn't so much those who were propagating these theories. It was the lack of challenge from elsewhere. What we also quickly saw was university leaders not coming out quickly enough or at all to condemn the terrorist atrocities that have been perpetrated on 7th of October. Now, universities try not to take political stances generally, um, but of course politics are involved in, in any institution. But after 9-11, the 7-7 atrocities, the kidnap of Nigerian schoolgirls by Boko Haram, the killing of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter and many other pivotal events that have grabbed the, the world's attention. Universities have put out statements expressing sympathy with the victims, not necessarily a political position, but at least sympathy, at least acknowledgement. Some of the universities that did express a statement um, talked about both sides. And this again was sort of a red flag to me. Why is it that Jews are always treated differently to other people, even in the times of their most grave crises and when they are mourning so many of their debt. 
Um, and then what we saw was students and staff feeling and saying privately unable to talk about or challenge the anti-Semitism that was coming out from universities. Now, more recently, we've seen the encampments that started in America and have swept across many of the universities, dozens of them in the UK, encampments that express solidarity with the Palestinians, but also express what we consider and we know to be anti-Semitic views from the river to the sea, which is, you know, about wiping Israel off the map. And we can go into it if anyone wants me to about where anti-Zionism becomes anti-Semitism. There is, of course, legitimate criticism of Israel, but denying Jews the right of self-determination is inherently anti-Semitic because it's treating the Jews as a nation as different to all other nations who are allowed this right to govern over themselves and to have a homeland. Um, but also we saw a rise in harassment and discrimination against Jewish students, not only from the encampments, but also emboldened and enabled by those encampments. And we saw universities, and they're not a homogenous group in this way, they, they have different governance structures and they have different ways of dealing with things, but we saw universities struggling to know what to do about these encampments um, that were very often in the center of universities or in the shared space, often disrupting university events and teaching and graduations and summer balls and all sorts of things. Um, we saw demands from students and from staff for universities to cut all ties with Israeli institutions. Now, we don't see those same demands um, where it comes to the genocide against the Uyghurs and uh, institutional ties with China. We don't see those demands where, where it comes to many other conflict zones or, or political issues. Um, and what we heard from our students and from academics and professional staff members at universities was the creation of a hostile environment for Jews. Around this time, it must be February or March of this year, um, Anthony Julius, and who's a professor at UCL in, 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 of law, and Daniel Hochhauser, who's a professor of medicine, decided to set up a group of Jewish professors um, around the UK to try and deal with and address and discuss and become a port of call for the anti-Semitism that we have seen sweeping through UK universities. Now, I say this with a caveat. I'm not someone that sees anti-Semitism around every corner or behind every door. There, I've experienced anti-Semitism, often inadvertently, people not realizing that it'd be useful to check the calendar to see if a meeting that I'm meant to speak at is on Rosh Hashanah or, um, you know, um, people who are running a conference on anti-Semitism, scheduling it at such a time that Orthodox Jews can't attend because of Shabbat. Um, but usually the anti-Semitism is, is sort of, it can be explained away. The overt anti-Semitism that was enabled after the 7th of October, I think took many of us by surprise. Not all of us, but many of us. And this ICPG, this professorial group, was really created because we academics are the university and there's excellent organizations like the Union of Jewish Students who are there to support students, but they're, they're supporting from outside. Um, and we needed to think about anti-Semitism holistically. What do we do about the boycott of Israeli academics, the cancellation of them? What do we do about the failures to publish their research or people being taken off projects? What do we do about Israeli students who are being directly discriminated against within the classroom? And then more broadly, what do we do for the 10,000 Jewish students, 10,000 or so Jewish students, who are looking to go to university and don't just want to know, is there going to be a Jewish society that's boycotted? Are they going to be um, harassed or hassled by fellow students? But also what will the universities do to protect them because they have a duty of care towards them? Now, these are really tough questions that can't easily be answered, but we have models for how we address discrimination uh, within institutions. The feminists did it first because, you know, feminists do. And 
there's models for universities around the gender pay gap, around um, women in science, technology, engineering. Uh, there's there's ways of looking at universities and supporting them to do better. And the same is true for what we call the race equality charter mark, looking at race and ethnicity um, within university structures, students and staff and, and awarding gaps and things like that. We need to foreground anti-Semitism in such a way. And in many ways, this is anathema to, to those of us who have been raised in the Jewish community. We are 15 million people of 8 billion around the world. We're 0.2% of the world's population. We live in 98 out of 193 countries. And there's not a country that we live in where Jews haven't been persecuted or murdered or discriminated against for being Jewish, including in this country, where we were only allowed back in again a few hundred years ago. Um, we're taught to keep our heads down, to not challenge, to be in some ways grateful that we are being allowed to live and work and exist in a country that doesn't directly discriminate against us, that does afford us freedom of religion or belief to slaughter animals in the way that we want to for those of us that are not vegetarian, um, to um, pray in synagogues, to have schools that our children can attend. And we try not to make too much of a fuss about the fact that we need to have security guards outside of our synagogues in order to pray, that we need to have barbed wire outside of our schools, that our children have uh, intruder alerts as well as fire alarms, which you would normally get the fire alarm drills in most schools, but not the, the intruder alerts on what to do if someone tries to bomb you for being Jewish. Um, I went around the world in 2018 and 2019 to help the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief write the first ever UN report on anti-Semitism as a human rights abuse and discovered the many different ways in which being Jewish requires security and protection, both from the state, but also, as we have in the UK, from members of the public. Because we're taught to keep our heads down and to be grateful, to be allowed to exist within societies, it's it took 7th of October and what's happening in universities now for us to come together as a group of academics and say it's time now to, to challenge the institutions to do better. It's not enough to say, is there a chaplain on campus and is there provision of kosher food and are students allowed a Jewish society, which they're not always. The University of Essex uh, tried to stop a Jewish society a number of years ago and had to have a review into the illegality of preventing Jewish students assembling together um, as a group. But um, there's a lot of work to be done. And it was this volume, it was editing this volume, plug it again, about universities that really opened my eyes to the work that needs to be done. There's a a, a really interesting piece in here uh, they're all really interesting, but there's a really interesting piece in here by Cara Gisela, uh, who, who talks about the history of anti-Semitism within feminism and how anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic discourse within feminism has now informed so many other disciplines that rely on that feminist literature. There's a, a piece in here about, by Gunther Jacelli, about why anti-Semitism has taken hold in elite universities in particular. Um, there, are, there are different pieces about different uh, disciplinary areas and the theories of anti-Semitism and the tropes that have become so normalized within them. Now, I would encourage you, if you're interested in universities, you work in universities, you have children in universities, to read this, this volume in particular, because it is only through challenging the anti-Semitism that I would say pervades the disciplines. Um, it's a small minority, but a vocal minority in the encampments. And it's a small minority, but a vocal minority within these disciplines. But what they've managed to do is close down opposition or debate from other people. What they've managed to do is to say, this cannot be challenged. And in order to challenge it, and in order to address it, what we really need to do is understand it, understand where it came from and understand the role that it's playing in the young people who leave the universities um, with these ideas that Israel is an apartheid state or that Israel is perpetrating a genocide 
or that Zionism is racism, or that Israel is full of white settler colonialists, even though we know that the, the majority of people in Israel are actually from, um, from Mizrahi, from Arab and North African descent. We need to understand how that then plays out in what they're doing in their roles in the media, in the civil service, in the arts, and then challenge it for the next generation. I'm not saying that this generation of, of, of people working in those areas is lost, but what we can do in universities is challenge, is challenge that for the next generation. And the other thing we must do in universities is raise the awareness of what anti-Semitism is, explain the different ways it manifests from the far right to the far left, to the radical Islamist anti-Semitism. We need to be able to talk about it. The, the feminists um, taught us this lesson years ago. For a long time, no one understood what sexual harassment was um, until the feminists named it as sexual harassment. And by naming the problem, you can address the problem. I think one of the crucial things that we, that we have failed to do as a community, a very small minority, is name the problem. Um, so now, we are at a point where it's time for change. And that is partly what I'm talking about is this book, uh, which gives the theory and the responses and the reactions from academics across different disciplines, across different geographies. But it's also time for us to make, make changes within the university sector. And um, that's what we need to do, particularly those of us, the, the reason it was set up as a professorial group is those of us that don't need to look for promotion that can't really um, have ramifications. And I mean, there are repercussions always, but in quite the same way as more junior colleagues, it's it's on us to, to think about ways forward so that we can implement effective changes um, so that this type of anti-Semitism doesn't rear its ugly head again. I can see a question already in the chat. Um, I don't know if everyone else can see it, Alan, so I'll just read it out. Um, it says, what if the university shows no interest in reviewing their academics and they themselves are surrounded by colleagues who agree with them and exist in echo chambers? That is exactly the problem in universities. Um, but most people who exist in these echo chambers, most, many, are not actually anti-Semitic. They just don't hear other points of view and other narratives. And it's not only on anti-Semitism. During the vote on Brexit, I had colleagues who had their reasons for voting for to stay in the European Union and they were vocal about it. I also had colleagues who had their reasons for voting to leave the European Union and felt that they could not talk about it in academia. I have colleagues who vote Labour or Lib Dem or other parties who feel able to discuss it. Those who vote Conservative or Reform, again, don't feel able to discuss these out loud within their workplace. Um, this is a problem of the left taking over a space because it shuts down the ability to have difficult discussions about societal challenges. Um, but I, I was involved with discussions about conflicts of human rights between women and transgender individuals, um, which was almost taboo to discuss in universities. And Israel and Palestine is another one. It, it becomes one of those topics where you're allowed any opinion so long as it's the right opinion, in inverted commas. The way to address and challenge that is for academics to exercise their academic freedom and actually raise these issues. Hold, hold panels, hold talks, hold conferences, bring these issues into the classroom, enable spaces where people can ask questions. Our students, by and large, want to learn. They have a thirst for knowledge. But if they're only hearing one side of the argument, if they're only hearing one opinion, they don't have an opportunity to think for themselves. So it's incumbent on us. And, and I think that for many of us, we didn't realize how important that was. Many, but not all. There are people that have been out there challenging the things for quite some time, including David Hirsch, the co-editor of this book. Second question. Can I tell you a little bit more about the difference between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism? Can I give examples of things that are anti-Zionist, but not anti-Semitic? Yes, I can do. Um, the, the definition that I use of anti-Semitism is treating Jews as though they are different to all other people. And anti when anti-Zionism becomes anti-Semitism is where 
Jews are told that they do not have the right to their own homeland, even though all other people are told that they do have that right. Now, this right, what we call the human right of peoples to self-determine who governs over them and to have permanent uh, sovereignty over their natural resources started with Woodrow Wilson um, and evolved during the Second World War. And it became the beginning of the decolonization movement. And it's a foundational human right and the idea was to throw off the yoke of colonialism and to allow people to determine who governs over them. Now, I can't choose the government for me, but I can be part of a collective of people in this country that exercises my democratic right to choose who governs over me. Um, now, there are people around the world, peoples, who have not had that right fulfilled. The Kurdish people, for example, um, the Rohingya, the the Native Americans, uh, the Kitox, there's all sorts of groups of peoples who are looking to exercise their right of self-determination and the Palestinians are one of those groups. The, in 1947, when the partition plan was created by the United Nations to divide the land between the state of Israel, a land for the Jews and the state of Palestine, a land for the Arabs, that was when the Jews were exercising their right of self-determination, when they declared the state um, in 1948. That was the beginning of that right being implemented. To then turn around to the Jews and say, you are the only group who are not allowed to exercise that right, and the state will be taken away from you, or you must change the state into one state that is not a Jewish homeland, is inherently anti-Semitic because it's treating the Jews as different to all other peoples that the rest of the world recognizes have the right of self-determination, even if they've not exercised it. Then there are, so that's the that's the broad um, idea of where anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism collide. What then happens is that there will be statements made. So for example, something like from the river to the sea. Um, some people might say that's anti-Zionist. Uh, until they look at the Hamas Charter, which I challenge everyone to look at, because I think we need to know what the issues are in order to address them. And in the Hamas Charter, it talks about from the river to the sea, the land of Israel will be, well, the state of Israel will be destroyed. And crucially, it talks about that this includes that every Jew will be killed, so that there's none hiding behind a tree and none hiding under a rock. So it's, it's got a genocidal intent. Um, so it from the river to the sea becomes a slogan that sounds anti-Zionist, but is actually about destroying all the Jews. Um, my father says that there's a, a similar line about being a free people in, um, in the Israel National Anthem. There's a difference between saying being a free people in one's own land and the Hamas Charter, which that slogan is, is founded on, which talks about genociding all of the Jews. Um, and there are many other examples of, of this, and I, I'd ha I'm happy to, to talk to them at a, another time if, if the person who asked the question wants to send me an email. Another question, what should happen when university administrators, the equality, diversity, inclusion, the proctor offices cannot recognize anti-Semitic speech and acts and refuse to reach out to consulting services? I have a problem with consulting services because they might know what anti-Semitism is, but they don't know how universities function. I'm a big believer in, and I'm, this is not my expression, it's it's stolen from a, from a sort of a progressive movement um, that's called For Us Bias. I think that we have to take control, um, those of us within institutions, women talk about for us and by us, um, we have to take control within the institutions. So there are many academics who understand what anti-Semitism is, who could provide that training that is context specific to the sector and context specific to their own institutions. Um, we have Black History Month, we have, um, we have Pride Month, we have many awareness, those of us working in universities know that we have many awareness raising events around disability and disability discrimination um, and around all sorts of other equality, diversity and inclusion issues. We need to seize the mantle and, and stop providing and demanding that there is similar awareness raising around anti-Semitism. And it won't happen quickly and it won't happen overnight. But I, I think the way of doing it is showing the universities what a problem this is and providing them with solutions. And it can start with something as small as having 
a session within a department or a session for the the UEB or for the pro vice chancellors around anti-Semitism. It can start with, I mean, my university has been fantastic on, on lots of levels, including our vice chancellor meeting with our Jewish society students, um, as well as meeting with members of the encampment and really learning and trying to understand more about the issues that we face. Anonymous attendee says, in my university, the disciplinary authorities are reluctant to move against those in the encampments, even when they are clearly in breach of disciplinary rules. Is there anything that can be done? We're certainly seeing a the tide turning. There is a there is a, a a conflict of rights here that needed to be addressed and needs to be addressed in some universities. There is a right to freedom of assembly. There is a right to peacefully protest. These are fundamental to functioning democracies. Um, but there's also the right of individuals to not be harassed or discriminated against on their protected characteristics. And these encampments where they have crossed the line clearly have done so. And that's before we get to any unlawful acts of violence or threats or intimidation from members of encampments. And often these members are not university students, but are outside agitators that come in. Um, each university needs to address these differently, but there is advice and guidance that we can provide as the ICPG on different ways of addressing this. Um, there's also the need for outside people to write to the universities, particularly if they study at those universities or have links to them, to make it clear um, that this is a live issue that, that is cared about not only within the university sector. Um, some universities have closed down the encampments um, or have threatened legal action. Some universities have taken disciplinary action against students, but then other universities like Goldsmiths have caved to the demands from the encampment. So each one is different. And I, because I because I don't know which university you're at, I can't answer better than that. But like I said, um, the previous question, I'm very happy to to talk about this offline if, if we can be of any help. Um, so I got a little sidetracked by the questions and I'm really happy to take them because I think this is really important um, to sort of have open discussion about these things. The one thing that I will say is many people um, are concerned about young people that they know, their children, other people going off to universities within this kind of environment. And I want to make clear that there is hostility towards Jews from this small group of people. But there's also a large majority of students who neither know nor care about what's going on in Israel or in Gaza, um, for whom they anti-Semitism is not something that they think about or perpetrate or, or, or really are aware of. The issues may arise, some issues may arise, they almost certainly will arise during Freshers' Week, and during um, student fairs where they can go and sign up for things like Jewish societies um, or Israel societies, if they have them on campus, there is some concern. And at the same time, the Union of Jewish Students and the IPCPG is providing support to universities and advice about how to navigate these, these issues. Um, I would encourage anyone who is concerned or who has a child or young person in their life who's going to university, who's worried about these issues or worried about specific universities to get in touch with us. The, the, the website gives the, the contact details of how to do so and to get in touch with the Union of Jewish Students who of course have a wealth of information on this topic. Question, how would you account for the Jewish participants we have seen taking part in pro Gaza encampments on campuses, particularly in the States? Are they naive? Oh, sorry, I've lost the question. Are they naive or misguided? Or is it a valid expression of their Jewish identity? I mean, I can't answer if it's a valid expression of one's Jewish identity. Um, I think we can account for um, this idea that David Hirsch talks about in, in his 2017 book, this idea of the communities of the good. Um, if you want to be a part of the communities of the good, <coughs> excuse me, you have to toe the party line on certain issues. And if you speak out on them, you immediately get labelled as an outsider, as an interloper, as someone who is, has been expelled from that community. And nowhere is this clearer than in Jeremy Corbyn's version of the Labour Party, that those who spoke out on things like anti-Semitism, 
who were immediately sort of pushed to the margins and sidelined. This has been going on in universities for longer, in the um, universities and colleges union, for example, um, with quite a famous case that was taken by Ronnie Fraser against them for, for where anti-Israel sentiment um, and anti-Zionism was alleged to be anti-Semitism and where, where Jews were being pushed to the margins. We've seen this throughout many institutions. I mean, the United Nations with Zionism is racism for many decades. Um, I think that the students who are part of the liberal progressive political movements, which, you know, in some universities are bigger than others, and we see it. The more elite the university, the more middle and upper class the student cohort, the more the bigger these progressive liberal circles are, because ultimately these students have more time on their hands. They don't need to go and be working a part time job in Tesco to help fund their studies. <clears throat> They're often living on campuses rather than away from campuses. We know that uh, students were, were, with more socioeconomic um, needs will often live at home because it's cheaper. And um, and they become part of these communities. Um, there may well be students who have great theoretical and ideological positions um, on anti-Zionism, but many others will have been swept along because if their communities of the good are correct on non-discrimination against LGBT people, or against people with disabilities or racism, which they are correct on, then what they assume that they will be being fed the correct information on Israel and Palestine and what happened on 7th of October. Um, and so again, it goes back to the purpose of universities, which is knowledge production from academic research and teaching and learning. And if we're not teaching this enough in the classrooms and putting on enough events and talking to our students about it, then they're only hearing one side. Another question, is there an inevitable conflict between the Palestinian right to self-determination as a nation and the Jewish right to self-determination in a national homeland? I see this echoed at universities in the division between those who support the right for Israel to exist and those who support Palestinian rights. I see no conflict between supporting Israel's right to exist and the Palestinian right to a homeland. Um, there needs to be a political solution. It needs to be a two-state solution. Um, there is no conflict of rights where it comes to those two, unless you're talking about the genocidal terrorists of Hamas who seek to take the whole of the land and genocide the Jews, or the far-right extremist settlers who would like to do the same and have the whole of the land with no Palestinians living on it. But there, there is no inherent conflict of rights um, it's about finding a, a political negotiated settlement whereby both countries, both peoples, have their right to a state with security on their borders and their right to live in peace. An another um, question. My university has refused to publicly acknowledge it has a problem of antisemitism this entire year, even though it has been made public um, and even reached national media. Again, it's really difficult to comment on individual universities and cases without knowing the universities, and it's probably better to comment on it offline where um, it's not being recorded. Um, thank you very much for your very nice comment. Um, as a concerned grandmother who has a grandson in college in Boston who's experienced a camp encampments, thank goodness he remained safe. He was told by the Jewish Federation to stay away from demonstrations and keep a low profile. And this is a problem because very often the Jewish students for their own safety are being told to stay away. But actually these are their universities and very often their homes as well. And very often these encampments are outside libraries or there are demands that, that people say certain things or sign certain things or do certain things in order to access the spaces that they're entitled to go to as students. Um, it's disruptive, but it's also victim blaming. It's victim blaming that we are telling students, and I understand for, for your grandson's safety and all of the all of the um, Jewish students who have been physically unsafe and threatened and distressed and harassed by these encampments. On an individual level, of course, I would say to every student, stay away. But then at a group level, it becomes a victim blaming circle. And because the Jewish students are a tiny minority, um, it becomes incumbent on them for their own safety. Whereas, could you imagine if this was any other group, if we were turning around to students with disabilities or racial minorities and saying to them, you need to stay away from these encampments for your own safety, there'd be outrage. 
um, which comes back again to this other ring of Jews and treating Jews as though they're different to all other um, to all other students. Question, what about right-wing Jewish students being aggressive against or trying to shut up left-wing Jewish students? Do we ignore that? Aggression is never okay. Violence is never okay. The, the purpose of universities for knowledge production, as I keep harping on about, is also about knowledge production through engaging and discussing in a respectful manner. Now, we've all had arguments and we all know what it's like to engage in a non-respectful manner, but that doesn't make aggression, harassment, or intimidation okay ever. And unless a, a student is being challenged because they are espousing um, incitement to racial hatred or other similar views, then it's not okay for right-wing students or left-wing students to be treating other students in that manner. Um, there are student codes of conduct, they're different in different universities, there are student disciplinary officers, um, but what we've seen time and again, whether it's on marches through capital cities or whether it's in, in encampments, is that where you have a large group of students, the, the policing and securitization of them is often far less than the small minority who are challenging them, who will often then be uh, disciplined in a more heavy handed way or a more appropriate way. But where you've got so many students or so many protesters that there aren't enough police or security to address them appropriately, they are often allowed to get away with things that are acts of harassment, intimidation and violence. Um, Another question. It appears that many organizations that fight anti-Semitism are unable to treat racial discrimination and violence against Israelis with the same seriousness. How could this be rectified? Well, it depends very much on the country that you're in. Um, in the UK, we have the Equality Act of 2010, which has certain protected characteristics, disability, maternity, sex, gender reassignment. Um, it has freedom of religion or belief, which uh, Jews fall under in terms of when when we're talking about Judaism as a religion. Um, but there's also protection um, for racial minorities, which also includes ethnicity and nationality. So it's very much about um, whether or not students are aware of their rights within the jurisdiction they live in, and also aware where to go, how to whistleblow, how to access advice, if they are being discriminated against. Um, so the law can exist as an ideal, but unless people know how to actualize their rights as a reality, then the two don't come together. One of the things that we as academics around the world in all universities need to be doing is challenging our universities to make clear to students who are Jewish or who are Israeli what their rights are in the same robust manner that they make clear to students with disabilities or uh, racial minorities and, and other protected characteristics, what their rights are, and crucially where to go if their rights are being violated. Um, another comment, my university in the UK has recently set up a combat anti-Semitism working group, positive progress. This was after the encampment was taken down. And I think this is gonna happen more and more. Um, this is to Jay Prosser. I think that universities are waking up to the problems that are going on and they're realizing that this isn't some um you know just that that people are just having a moan that people are seeing anti-semitism around corners and i think over the summer in particular when many of these encampments i mean they're going to fizzle out because no one's on campus for them to be protesting to um or they're going to be taken down with disciplinary action or legal action we'll give the university some time and space before freshers week to really think about how to address these issues. And it's not the first crisis point universities have had. They've had it around sexism and misogyny. They've had it around racism. They've had it around disability. And, and so what we've got to do is help support them to take this forward. Well, you know, in a constructive, a, a constructive manner as critical friends to the institutions. Um, one more question. What do I think universities should do about social media posts of students, faculties, and clubs that promote anti-Semitic content? This is an excellent question. Um, where it's an official student society, um, student union society, um, then the university should be going to the students' unions because they are separate entities and challenging them because it's underneath their um, it, it, it's underneath their umbrella uh, and 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 they have a duty and responsibility to protect students from discrimination and harassment. Um, where it comes to faculty or staff, 
it's it's a really difficult issue. On the one hand, um, we have academic freedom and we should be encouraging respectful discussion and debate on really challenging and difficult societal issues because that's the purpose of, of the university. On the other hand, where it where it becomes unlawful speech, and again, that that will be different in every jurisdiction, right? So in Germany, you can't sell um, Nazi materials uh, because of the history of Germany. So they limit the freedom of expression there in line with the, the public aim of not having a rise of the Nazis again. In the UK, that's not the same. And in America, we have much clearer free speech, you know, that unless it's incitement to a, a crime, it's it's free speech. So depending on the jurisdiction, it has to deal with it. But what's actually more helpful than the law is the student and staff codes of conduct. Um, students and staff will be under codes of conduct. Disciplinary procedures can be brought uh, where a, a member of the university community has overstepped the parameters laid out. Each of those will be different depending on whether it's staff or student and depending on the university that they're at. But, but people should should be armed with that knowledge. People should, you know, other students should know what their code of conduct says. And if they see online this kind of thing, then they need to report it in. It's only through reporting it in that universities realise it's a problem and can take action. Certainly the universities can't monitor the social media of everyone who's within the community, but they can take action if it's brought to their attention. Um, why do universities and other equality questionnaires never consider Jewish as an ethnicity? Doesn't that make any meaningful research on anti-Semitism very difficult? It's an excellent question and I don't have the answer to it. I do know what I do, which is it often says, are you white British, white European, white other? I just put white other and put Jewish. But it's an excellent question because it comes back to this idea, is Judaism a religion or a race or an ethnicity or is it all three? And I think if it's all three, depending on the context in which you're discussing something. So when I'm talking about keeping Shabbat, I'm talking about Judaism as a religion. Um, and certainly it is there as a category under religion, um, but it's an excellent question. And I think it's one that we could definitely do some research and thinking about. Alan, I think that's all the questions that are in the chat. Yes, I let me just uh, reappear if I can, I think. I think you should. Um, I'm assuming people can see me. Right. So, as I said, there is one other question which I just wanted just to, because it was a general one. Barbara Conway has asked, are your anthologies available to the public? I'm not a student or an academic, but I have grandchildren who are postgraduate students in both the arts and engineering. The answer is yes, it is available. I think it's available on Amazon, as I remember, because I had to look it up. I will include a link to a suitable publishing uh, per, say, bookseller or or Amazon, and make sure the three. And it is right, the three uh, vol each volume is purchased separate, isn't it? It doesn't have to buy it. So on the Routledge website, you can buy it as a three volume anthology, and it's slightly cheaper than um, than if you buy it each volume separately. And as it was explained, each contribution is a short paper of about 3,000 words. It is not a great tome in their own rights, is it? No, no. And and my instructions to the authors were, this needs to be accessible, not have jargon. My mum needs to be able to read it and engage with it. My mum's incredibly intelligent, but she's not an academic specialist in this discipline and this one and this one and this one. Um, so I, I, I often say this to my students as well, that if they can't explain a legal concept to their parents or to someone that's not a lawyer, then they haven't understood it. So what we've hoped for is that each of these three or 4,000 word pieces are accessible and not full of jargon. Um, and therefore anyone can engage with them who's interested in the subject area. So, in fact, I think you had a copy there. You can just hold it out. It's not that thick, is it? It's not a thick no. book. There, turn it to the side. There we they're, go. It's not they're 50,000 word, 50, word books. Um, there's sort of 10 or 11 or 12 responses in each one, and, they, and they're short. Well, I think I can honestly say I don't think we've had quite as many questions, but... Uh, as ever, uh, as ever, I think even Jonathan would say that in his absence. But um, uh, it has been absolutely fascinating. I'm sure everybody will agree. Uh, you've dealt with some interest. You highlighted uh, uh, some. There's been some very interesting questions. It's raised all sorts of thoughts, and I and and 
I was just going to ask it, but you've answered it. It is across the world. It's not just limited to one country or one jurisdiction. It is all universities subject to the nature of their own immediate populations. Yes. So uh, assuming everybody can see me, I'm just now going to say before I formally uh, to say thank you. Um, uh, we have got a continuing programme of talks coming up over the next uh, rest of the summer. Next week, we have Martin Goodman, who's going to be, this is a, a complete change. He's going to be talking about Herod the Great, uh, a, a topic book that he's written. And then in the end of the month, we have Anna Merkin, the photographer, returning. Uh, again, he spoke last year and he's returning because he's passing through the UK again from Israel. We then have other speakers uh, all programmed uh, going forward on a Monday, subject to bank holidays and religious festivals, and we will continue to do so. As I said at the beginning, there will be recordings of talks whenever possible on the website, uh, and we will find the recordings and details of all our upcoming events. As, I, as Jonathan reminds us every week, uh, that all our talks are free, but there are facilities to make donation donations uh, online, uh, uh on the website through the links and i'll put it in tomorrow's email uh i also just point out there are messages coming thanking uh rosa for her talk such comments is uh, brilliant thank you very so much lots of food for thought and answering difficult questions they're all from around the country uh a time another talk in the future you've been asked for yes i can i'm already one stage ahead of you there now at this point normally jonathan shows up a book that we will send you but we will send you something but we'll have to check it's not the same as the one we sent your mother so that's the <laughs> i must True. remember to find out what jonathan said so with that in mind i again would like to thank rosa for joining us for a very very thought-provoking talk very informative i think we've all got to go with a lot of thought uh, and most probably a lot of other questions. Thank you again, and I uh, wish everybody a good night. Thank you. Thank you for having me.